The creative force the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor, He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God, St. John. What is a word? A mental concept or image, is it not? In originating language, words were coined to represent certain images or objects. The word horse, for instance, calls to mind the image left upon the retina and the brain by what one has seen of that quadruped. But what if there were no horses? What if one were called upon to create a horse, with no previous knowledge of such an animal? You'd have to build up a clear mental image of him first, would you not? You'd have to work out a mental picture of every part of his anatomy, every physical outline. You'd need a perfect mental concept of everything that is comprised in the word horse. And that was what happened when God created the world. In the beginning was the word, the mental concept, the image in God's mind of what he planned. And the word was made flesh. It took on shape and substance. It grew into a habitable world. It developed creatures like the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, and the beasts of the field. And finally man. To every one of these creatures, in turn, was given a certain amount of creative power. The creative force of the universe was working through them, and it did not look upon them as a completed job. It was and is still creating, still improving. The horse, for instance, was not originally the powerful animal we see today. It was a little larger than a fox. It developed its present proportions and qualities as the need for these arose. All life originally came from the sea, in the beginning, the waters covered the face of the earth. As volcanic action raised certain portions of the earth's surface above the waters, and as the moon's attraction caused the waters to rise or recede from the shores of these sections of dry land, certain creatures of the sea were left high and dry periodically. What happened to them? Did they die? In the beginning, yes, but as this regular movement of the waters became perceptible to the rudimentary intelligence of the sea animals, certain of them began to use the creative force working through them to enable them to survive. Where they had only gills to breathe within the water, they developed lungs that enabled them to breathe when left on dry land. And where the rough waters of the surf rolled them over and over on the rocky beaches, bruising and killing thousands of them, they developed calluses or shells, just as your feet or hands will develop calluses where they are subjected to hardware. Life then, as now, was a continually developing process. Those early forms of life was threatened by every kind of danger from floods, earthquakes, from droughts, from the desert heat, from glacial cold, from volcanic eruptions but each new danger was merely an incentive to find some new resource, to putting forth their creative force in some new shape. To meet one set of needs, the creative force formed the dinosaur, to meet another, the butterfly. Long before it worked up to man, we see its unlimited resourcefulness in a thousand ways. To escape danger in the water, some forms of life sought land. Pursued on land, they took to the air. To breathe in the sea, the creative force developed gills. Stranded on land, it perfected lungs. To meet one kind of dangare, it grew a shell. For another, it developed fleetness of foot, or wings that carried it into the air. To protect itself from glacial cold, it grew fur. In temperate climes, hair. Subject to alternate heat and cold, it produced feathers. But ever, from the beginning, it showed its power to meet every changing condition, to answer every creature need. Had it been possible to stamp out this creative force, or halt its constant upward development, it would have perished ages ago, when fire and flood, drought and famine followed each other in quick succession. But obstacles, misfortunes, cataclysms, were to it merely new opportunities to assert its power. In fact, it required difficulties or obstacles to stir it up, to make it show its energy and resourcefulness. The great reptiles, the monster beasts of antiquity, passed on as the conditions changed that had made them possible, but the creative force stayed, changing as each age changed, always developing, always improving. When God put this creative force into his creatures, he gave to it unlimited energy, unlimited resource. No other power can equal it. No force can defeat it. No obstacle can hold it back. Al through the history of life and mankind, you can see its directing intelligence rising to meet every need of life. No one can follow it down through the ages without realizing that the purpose of existence is growth, development. Life is dynamic, not static. It is ever moving forward not standing still. The one unpardonable sin in Al of nature is to stand still, to stagnate. 
The Gigantosaurus, that was over a hundred feet long and as big as a house, the Tyrannosaurus, that had the strength of a locomotive and was the last word in frightfulness, the pterodactyl or flying dragon the giant monsters of prehistoric ages are gone. They ceased to serve a useful purpose. They stood still while the life around them passed them by. Egypt and Persia, Greece and Rome, all the great empires of antiquity, perished when they ceased to grow. China built a wall around herself and stood still for a thousand years. In all of nature, to cease to grow is to perish. It is for men and women who are not ready to stand still, who refuse to cease to grow, that this book is written. Its purpose is to give you a clearer understanding of your own potentialities, to show you how to work with and take advantage of the infinite energy and power of the creative force working through you. The terror of the man at the crossways, not knowing which way to turn, should be no terror for you, for your future is of your own making. The only law of infinite energy is the law of supply. The creative principle is your principle. To survive, to win through, to triumphantly surmount all obstacles has been its everyday practice since the beginning of time. It is no less resourceful now than it ever was. You have but to supply the urge, to work in harmony with it, to get from it anything you need. For if this creative force is so strong in the lowest forms of animal life that it can develop a shell or a poison to meet a need, if it can teach the bird to circle and dart, to balance and fly, if it can grow a new limb on a spider or crab to replace a lost one, how much more can it do for you a reasoning, rational being, with a mind able to work with this creative force, with energy and purpose and initiative to urge it on? The evidence of this is all about you. Take up some violent form of exercise, and in the beginning your muscles are weak, easily tired. But keep on a few days, and what happens? The creative force in you promptly strengthens them, toughens them, to meet their need. All through your daily life, you find this force steadily at work. Embrace it, work with it, take it to your heart, and there is nothing you cannot do. The mere fact that you have obstacles to overcome is in your favor, for when there is nothing to be done, when things run along too smoothly, the creative force seems to sleep. It is when you need it, when you call upon it urgently, that it is most on the job. It differs from luck in this, that fortune is a fickle jade who smiles most on those who need her least. Stake your last penny on the turn of a card have nothing between you and ruin but the spin of a wheel or the speed of a horse and the chances are a hundred to one that luck will desert you it is just the opposite with the creative force in you. As long as things run smoothly, as long as life flows along like a song, this creative force seems to slumber, secure in the knowledge that your affairs can take care of themselves. But let things start going wrong, let ruin or death stare you in the face then is the time this creative force will assert itself if you but give it the chance. There is a Napoleonic feeling of power that ensures success in the knowledge that this invincible creative force is behind your every act. Knowing that you have with you a force which never yet has failed in anything it has undertaken, you can go ahead in the confident knowledge that it will not fail in your case. The ingenuity which overcame every obstacle in making you what you are, is not likely to fall short when you have immediate need for it. It is the reserve strength of the athlete, the second wind of the runner, the power that, in moments of great stress or excitement, you unconsciously call upon to do the deeds which you ever after look upon as superhuman. But they are in no wise superhuman. They are merely beyond the capacity of your conscious self. Ally your conscious self with that sleeping giant within you, rouse him daily to the task and those superhuman deeds will become your ordinary, everyday accomplishments. It matters not whether you are banker or lawyer, businessman or clerk, whether you are the custodian of millions or have to struggle for your daily bread. The creative force makes no distinction between high and low, rich and poor. The greater your need, the more readily will it respond to your call. Wherever there is an unusual task, wherever there is poverty or hardship or sickness or despair, there this servant of your mind waits, ready and willing to help, asking only that you call upon him. And not only is it ready and willing, but it is always able to help. Its ingenuity and resource are without limit. It is mind. It is thought. It is the telepathy that carries messages without the spoken or written word. It is the sixth sense that warns you of unseen dangers. No matter how stupendous and complicated, or how simple your problem may be, the solution of it is somewhere in mind, in thought. And since the solution does exist, this mental giant can find it for you. It can know, and it can do, every right thing. Whatever it is necessary for you to know, Whatever it is necessary for you to do, you can know and you can do if you will but seek the help of this genie of your mind and work with it in the right way. To every living creature, 
God gave enough of this creative force to enable it to develop whatever it felt that it needed for survival. Behind and working through every living thing was this creative force, and to each was given the power to draw upon it at need. With the lower forms of life, that call had to be restricted to themselves, to their own bodies. They could not change their environment. They could develop a house of shell in which to live, like the crustaceans or the snail or the turtle. They could use the creative force to develop strength or fleetness or teeth and claws anything within or pertaining to themselves. But aside from building nests or caves or other more or less secure homes, they could not alter conditions around them. To man alone was given the power to make his own environment. To him alone was given dominion over things and conditions. That he exercises this power, even today, only to a limited extent, does not alter the fact that he has it. Man was given dominion. And God said let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Of course, few believe in that dominion. Fewer still exercise it for their own good or the good of all. But everyone uses the creative force in him to an extent. Everyone builds his own environment. Don't tell me, some will say indignantly, that I built these slums around me, that I am responsible for the wretched conditions under which I work, that I had anything to do with the squalor and poverty in which my family have to live. Yet that is exactly what we do tell you. If you were born in poverty and misery, it was because your parents imaged these as something forced upon them, something they could not help, a condition that was necessary and to be expected. Thinking so, they used the creative force working through them to fasten those conditions upon themselves as something they were meant to suffer and could do nothing about. Then you in your turn accepted those conditions as what you were born to and fastened them upon yourself by your supine acceptance of them, by failing to claim better ones, by making no great or sustained efforts to get out of them. All history shows that the determined soul who refuses to accept poverty or lack can change these to riches and power if he has the determination and the perseverance. The great men of the world have almost all come up from poverty and obscurity. The rich men of the world have mostly started with nothing. Always the real leaders of men, the real kings, have come up from the common people wrote Dr. Frank Crane. The finest flowers in the human flora grow in the woods pasture and not in the hothouse, no privileged class, no royal house, no carefully selected stock produced a Leonardo or a Michelangelo in art, a Shakespeare or Burns in letters, a Galli Corci or Paderewski in music, a Socrates or Kant in philosophy, an Edison or Pasteur in science, a Wesley or a Knox in religion. It is the need that calls forth such geniuses, the urgent need for development or expression, and it is because these men drew powerfully upon the creative force within them that they became great. As the poet put it, there is power within me which is life itself, I can turn to it and rest on it, as I turn to it and rest on it, it helps me and heals me all the time. There is wisdom itself within me which is life itself, I can turn to it and rest on it, as I turn to it and rest on it, it helps me and heals me all the time. There is love itself within me which is life itself, I can turn to it and rest on it, as I turn to it and rest on it, it helps me and heals me all the time. Look within, said Marcus Aurelius. Within is the fountain of all good. Such a fountain, where springing waters can never fail, do thou dig still deeper and deeper. God gave to man, and to man alone, the power to make his own environment. He can determine for himself what he needs for survival, and if he holds to that thought with determination, he can draw whatever is necessary from the creative force working through him to make it manifest. First the word, the mental image, then the creation or manifestation. Professor Michael Pupin says science finds that everything is a continually developing process. In other words, creation is still going on, all around you. Use your creative force to create the conditions you desire rather than those you fear. The life about you is constantly in a state of flux. All you have to do is create the mental mold in which you want the creative force to take form, and then hold to that mold with persistence and determination until the creative force in it becomes manifest. Dr. Titus Bull, the famous neurologist, says Mattel is spirit at a lower rate of vibration. When a patient is cured, it is spirit in the cell doing the healing according to its own inherent pattern. No doctor ever cured a patient. All he can do is to make it possible for the patient to heal himself. And if that is true of the body, it is just as true of conditions around you. Matter physical materials is spirit or creative force at a lower rate of vibration. The spirit or creative force is all around you. 
You are constantly forming it into mental molds, but more often than not these are dictated by your fears rather than your desires. Why not determinedly form only good molds? Why not insist upon the things you want? It is just as easy, and it works just as surely. There is no great and no small, writes Emerson, to the soul that maketh all, and where it cometh, all things are, and it cometh everywhere. I am the owner of the sphere, of the seven stars and the solar year, of Caesar's hand and Plato's brain, of Lord Christ's heart, and Shakespeare's strain. Give me a base of support, said Archimedes, and with a lever I will move the world. And the base of support is that all started with mind. In the beginning was nothing a fire mist. Before anything could come of it there had to be an idea, a mental model on which to build. The God mind supplied that idea, that model. Therefore the primal cause is mind. Everything must start with an idea. Every event, every condition, everything is first an idea in the mind of someone. Before you start to build a house, you draw up a plan of it. You make an exact blueprint of that plan, and your house takes shape in accordance with your blueprint. Every material object takes form in the same way. Mind draws the plan. Thought forms the blueprint, well drawn or badly done as your thoughts are clear or vague. It all goes back to the one cause. The creative principle of the universe is mind, and thought forms the molds in which its eternal energy takes shape. But just as the effect you get from electricity depends upon the mechanism to which the power is attached, so the effects you get from mind depend upon the way you use it. We are all of us dynamos. The power is their unlimited power. But we've got to connect it with something set at some task give it work to do else are we no better off than the animals. The seven wonders of the world were built by men with few of the opportunities or facilities that are available to you. They conceived these gigantic projects first in their own minds, pictured them so vividly that the creative force working through them came to their aid and helped them to overcome obstacles that most of us would regard as insurmountable. Imagine building the Pyramid of Giza, enormous stone upon enormous stone, with nothing but bare hands. Imagine the labor, the sweat, the heartbreaking toil of erecting the Colossus of Rhodes, between whose legs a ship could pass. Yet men built these wonders, in a day when tools were of the crudest and machinery was undreamed of, by using the unlimited power of the creative force. That creative force is in you, working through you, but it must have a model on which to work. It must have thoughts to supply the molds. There are in universal mind ideas for millions of wonders greater far than the seven wonders of the world. And those ideas are just as available to you as they were to the artisans of old, as they were to Michelangelo when he built St. Peter's in Rome, as they were to the architect who conceived the Empire State Building or the engineer who planned the Hell Gate Bridge. Every condition, every experience of life is the result of our mental attitude. We can do only what we think we can do. We can be only what we think we can be. We can have only what we think we can have. What we do, what we are, what we have, all depend upon what we think. There is only one limit upon the creative force, and that is the limit we impose upon it. We can never express anything that we do not first believe in. The secret of all power, all success, all riches, is in first thinking powerful thoughts, successful thoughts, thoughts of wealth, of supply. We must build them in our own mind first. As Edgar A. Guest so well expressed it, you can do as much as you think you can, but you'll never accomplish more. If you're afraid of yourself, young man, there's little for you in store. For failure comes from the inside first, it's there if we only knew it, and you can win, though you face the worst, if you feel that you're going to do it. William James, the famous psychologist, said that the greatest discovery in a hundred years was the discovery of the power of the subconscious mind. It is the greatest discovery of all time. It is the discovery that man has within himself the power to control his surroundings, that he is not at the mercy of chance or luck, that he is the arbiter of his own fortunes, that he can carve out his own destiny. He is the master of the creative force working through him. As James Allen puts it, dream lofty dreams, and as you dream, so shall you become. Your vision is the promise of what you shall one day be, your ideal is the prophecy of what you shall at last unveil. For matter is in the ultimate but a product of thought, the result of the mold into which you have put the creative force working through you. Even the most material scientists admit that matter is not what it appears to be. According to physics, matter, be it the human body or a log of wood it makes no difference which, is made up of an aggregation of distinct minute particles called atoms. Considered individually, these atoms are so small that they can be seen only with the aid of a powerful microscope, if at all. Until comparatively recent years, 
these atoms were supposed to be the ultimate theory regarding matter. We ourselves and all the material world around us were supposed to consist of these infinitesimal particles of matter, so small that they could not be seen or weighted or smelled or touched individually but still particles of matter and indestructible. Now, however, these atoms have been further analyzed, and physicists tell us that they are not indestructible at all that they are mere positive and negative buttons of force or energy called protons and electrons, without hardness, without density, without solidity, without even positive actuality. In short, they are vortices in the ether whirling bits of energy dynamic, never static, pulsating with life, but the life is spiritual. As one eminent British scientist put it science now explains matter by explaining it away. And that, mind you, is what the solid table in front of you is made of, is what your house, your body, the whole world is made of whirling hits of energy. To quote the New York Herald Tribune, we used to believe that the universe was composed of an unknown number of different kinds of matter, one kind for each chemical element. The discovery of a new element had all the interest of the unexpected. It might turn out to be anything, to have any imaginable set of properties. That romantic prospect no longer exists. We know now that instead of many ultimate kinds of matter there are only two kinds. Both of these are really kinds of electricity. One is negative electricity, being, in fact, the tiny particle called the electron, familiar to radio fans as one of the particles vast swarms of which operate radio vacuum tubes. The other kind of electricity is positive electricity. Its ultimate particles are called protons. From these protons and electrons all of the chemical elements are built up. Iron and lead and oxygen and gold and all the others differ from one another merely in the number and arrangement of the electrons and protons which they contain. That is the modern idea of the nature of matter. Matter is really nothing hut electricity. Can you wonder then that scientists believe the time will come when mankind through mind can control all this energy, can be absolute master of the winds and the waves, can literally follow the master's precept if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, Ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. For modern science is coming more and more to the belief that what we call matter is a force subject wholly to the control of mind. So it would seem that, to a great degree at least, and perhaps altogether, this world round about us is one of our mind's own creating. And we can put into it, and get from it, pretty much what we wish. Nothing is, said Shakespeare, but thinking makes it so. And the psychologist of today says the same in a different way when he tells us that only those things are real to each individual that he takes into his consciousness. To one with no sense of smell, for instance, there is no such thing as fragrance. To one without a radio, there is no music on the airwaves. To quote from Applied Psychology, by Warren Hilton, the same stimulus acting on different organs of sense will produce different sensations. A blow upon the eye will cause you to see stars, a similar blow upon the ear will cause you to hear an explosive sound. In other words, the vibratory effect of a touch on eye or ear is the same as that of light or sound vibrations. The notion you may form of any object in the outer world depends solely upon what part of your brain happens to be connected with that particular nerve end that received an impression from the object. You see the sun without being able to hear it because the only nerve ends tuned to vibrate in harmony with the ether waves set in action by the sun are nerve ends that are connected with the brain center devoted to sight. If, says Professor James, we could splice the outer extremities of our optic nerves to our ears, and those of our auditory nerves to our eyes, we should hear the lightning and see the thunder, see the symphony and hear the conductor's movements. In other words, the kind of impressions we receive from the world about us, the sort of mental pictures we form concerning it in fact, the character of the outer world, the nature of the environment in which our lives are cast all these things depend for each one of us simply upon how he happens to be put together, upon his individual mental makeup. In short, it all comes back to the old fable of the three blind men and the elephant. To the one who caught hold of his leg, the elephant was like a tree. To the one who felt of his side, the elephant was like a wall. To the one who seized his tail, the elephant was like a rope. The world is to each one of us the world of his individual perceptions. You are like a radio receiving station. Every moment thousands of impressions are reaching you. You can tune in on whatever ones you like on joy or sorrow, on success or failure, on optimism or fear. You can select the particular impressions that will best serve you, you can hear only what you want to hear, you can shut out all disagreeable thoughts and sounds and experiences, or you can tune in on discouragement and failure and despair if these are what you want. 
Yours is the choice. You have within you a force against which the whole world is powerless. By using it, you can make what you will of life and of your surroundings. But, you will say, objects themselves do not change. It is merely the difference in the way you look at them. Perhaps. But to a great extent, at least, we find what we look for, just as, when we turn the dial on the radio, we tune in on whatever kind of entertainment or instruction we may wish to hear. Who can say that it is not our thoughts that put it there? And why shouldn't it be? All will agree that evil is merely the lack of good, just as darkness is the lack of light. There is infinite good ale about us. There is fluid cosmic energy from which to form infinitely more. Why should we not use our thoughts to find the good, or to mold it from the creative force all about us? Many scientists believe that we can, and that in proportion as we try to put into our surroundings the good things we desire, rather than the evil ones we fear, we will find those good things. Certain it is that we can do this with our own bodies. Just as certain that many people are doing it with the good things of life. They have risen above the conception of life in which matter is the master. Just as the most powerful forces in nature are the invisible ones heat, light, air, electricity so the most powerful forces of man are his invisible forces, his thought forces. And just as electricity can fuse stone and iron, so can your thought forces control your body, so can they win you honor and fortune, so can they make or mar your destiny. From childhood on we are assured on every hand by scientists, by philosophers, by our religious teachers, that ours is the earth and the fullness thereof. Beginning with the first chapter of Genesis, we are told that God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. All through the Old and the New Testament, we are repeatedly adjured to use these God-given powers. He that believeth on me said Jesus, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. The kingdom of God is within you. We hear all this, perhaps we even think we believe, but always, when the time comes to use these God-given talents, there is the doubt in our heart. Baduin expressed it clearly, to be ambitious for wealth and yet always expecting to be poor, to be always doubting your ability to get what you long for, is like trying to reach east by traveling west. There is no philosophy which will help a man to succeed when he is always doubting his ability to do so, and thus attracting failure. You will go in the direction in which you face, there is a saying that every time the sheep bleats, it loses a mouthful of hay. Every time you allow yourself to complain of your lot, to say, I am poor, I can never do what others do, I shall never be rich, I have not the ability that others have, I am a failure, luck is against me, you are laying up so much trouble for yourself. No matter how hard you may work for success, if your thought is saturated with the fear of failure, it will kill your efforts, neutralize your endeavors, and make success impossible. What was it made Napoleon the greatest conqueror of his day? Primarily his magnificent faith in Napoleon. He had a sublime belief in his destiny, an absolute confidence that the obstacle was not made which Napoleon could not find a way through or over or around. It was only when he lost that confidence, when he hesitated and vacillated for weeks between retreat and advance, that winter caught him in Moscow and ended his dreams of world empire. Fate gave him every chance first. The winter snows were a full month late in coming. But Napoleon hesitated and was lost. It was not the snows that defeated him. It was not the Russians. It was his loss of faith in himself. The kingdom of heaven the kingdom of heaven is within you. Heaven is not some faraway state the reward of years of tribulation here. Heaven is right here here and now in the original Greek text, the word used for heaven is ornos. Translated literally, ornos means expansion, in other words, a state of being where you can expand, grow, multiply, and increase. This interpretation is strengthened by Jesus' own description of what the kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, until the whole was leavened. 
What is the property of a mustard seed? It spreads a single seed will grow into a tree, a single tree will produce enough seeds to plant a great field. And what is the property of leaven or yeast? It expands in a single night it can expand a hundred times in size. So when Christ said that heaven was within us, he meant just what he said the power to multiply our happiness, to increase our good, to expand everything we need in life, is within each one of us. That most of us fail to realize this heaven that many are sickly and suffering, that more are ground down by poverty and worry is no fault of his. He gave us the power to overcome these evils, the kingdom of expansion is within us, the power to increase anything we have. If we fail to find the way to use it, the fault is ours. If we expand the evil instead of the good, that is our misfortune. To enjoy the heaven that is within us, to begin here and now to live the life eternal, takes only the right understanding and use of the creative force working through us. Even now, with a limited knowledge at our command, many people control circumstances to the point of making the world without an expression of their own world within, where the real thoughts, the real power, resides. Through this world within, they find the solution of every problem, the cause for every effect. Discover it and all power, all possession is within your control. For the world without is but a reflection of that world within. Your thought creates the condition your mind images. Keep before your mind's eye the image of all you want to be and you will see it reflected in the world without. Think abundance, feel abundance, believe abundance, and you will find that as you think and feel and believe, abundance will manifest itself in your daily life. But let fear and worry be your mental companions, thoughts of poverty and limitation dwell in your mind, and worry and fear, limitation and poverty will be your constant companions day and night. Your mental concept is all that matters. Its relation to matter is that of idea and form. There has got to be an idea before it can take form. The creative force working through you supplies you with limitless energy which will take whatever form your mind demands. Your thoughts are the mold which crystallizes this energy into good or ill according to the form you impress upon it. You are free to choose which. But whichever you choose, the result is sure. Thoughts of wealth, of power, of success, can bring only results commensurate with your idea of them. Thoughts of poverty and lack can bring only limitation and trouble. A radical doctrine, you'll say, and think me wildly optimistic. Because the world has been taught for so long to think that some must be rich and some poor, that trials and tribulations are a lot. That this is at best a veil of tears. The history of the race shows that what is considered to be the learning of one age is ignorance to the next age. Dr. Edwin E. Slauson, editor of Science Service, speaking of the popular tendency to fight against new ideas merely because they are new, said, Out through the history of science, we find that new ideas have to force their way into the common mind in disguise, as though they were burglars instead of benefactors of the in Emerson wrote, the virtue in most request is conformity. Self-reliance is its aversion. It loves not realities and creators, but names and customs. In the ages to come, man will look back upon the poverty and wretchedness of so many millions today, and think how foolish we were not to take advantage of the abundant creative force all about us. Look at nature, how profuse she is in everything. Do you suppose the mind that image that profuseness ever intended you to be limited, to have to scrimp and save in order to eke out a bare existence? There are hundreds of millions of stars in the heavens. Do you suppose the creative force which could bring into being worlds without number in such prodigality intended to stint you of the few things necessary to your happiness or well-being? Nature is prodigal in all that she does. Many insects increase at such a marvelous rate that if it were not for their almost equal death rate, the world would be unable to support them. Rabbits increase so rapidly that a single pair could have 13 million descendants in three years. Fish lay millions of eggs each year. Throughout nature, everything is lavish. Why should the creative force working through you be less generous when it comes to your own supply? Take as an example the science of numbers. Suppose our numbers were of metal that it was against the law to write figures for ourselves. Every time you wanted to do a sum in arithmetic you'd have to provide yourself with a supply of numbers, arrange them in their proper order, work out your problems with them. If your problems were too abstruse you might run out of numbers, have to borrow some from your neighbor or from the bank. How ridiculous, you say. Figures are not things, they are mere ideas, and we can add them or divide them or multiply them as often as we like. Anybody can have all the figures he wants. To be sure he can. And when you learn to use the creative force, you will find that you can multiply your material ideas in the same way. You will expand the good things in your life even as Jesus did the loaves and fishes. 
Thought externalizes itself through the creative force working through us. What we are depends entirely upon the images we hold before our mind's eye. Every time we think, we start a chain of causes which will create conditions similar to the thoughts which originated it. Every thought we hold in our consciousness for any length of time becomes impressed upon our subconscious mind and creates a pattern which the creative force weaves into our life or environment. All power is from within and is therefore under our own control. When you can direct your thought processes, you can consciously apply them to any condition, for all that comes to us in the world without is what we've already imaged in the world within. The source of all good, of everything you wish for, is mind, and you can reach it best through your subconscious. Mind will be to you whatever you believe it to be the kind and loving father whom Jesus pictured, always looking out for the well-being of his children or the dread judge that so many dogmatists would have us think. When a man realizes that his mind is part of the God mind, when he knows that he is only to take any right aspiration to this universal mind to see it realized, he loses all sense of worry and fear. He learns to dominate instead of to cringe. He rises to meet every situation, secure in the knowledge that everything necessary to the solution of any problem is in mind, and that he has but to take his problem to universal mind to have it correctly answered. For if you take a drop of water from the ocean, you know that it has the same properties as all the rest of the water in the ocean, the same percentage of sodium chloride. The only difference between it and the ocean is in volume. If you take a spark of electricity, you know that it has the same properties as the thunderbolt, the same power that moves trains or runs giant machines in factories. Again the only difference is in volume. It is the same with your mind and the God mind. The only difference between them is in volume. Your mind has the same properties as the God mind, the same creative genius, the same power over all the earth, the same access to all knowledge. Know this, believe it, use it, and yours is the earth and the fullness thereof. In the exact proportion that you believe yourself to be part of the God mind, sharing in its all power, in that proportion can you demonstrate the mastery over your own body and over the world about you. All growth, all supply is from the creative force working through you. If you would have power, if you would have wealth, you must first form the mold in this world within, in your subconscious mind, through belief and understanding. If you would remove discord, you must remove the wrong images images of ill health, of worry and trouble from within. The trouble with most of us is that we live entirely in the world without. We have no knowledge of that inner world which is responsible for all the conditions we meet and all the experiences we have. We have no conception of the Father that is within us. The inner world promises us life and health, prosperity and happiness dominion over all the earth. It promises peace and perfection for all its offspring. It gives you the right way and the adequate way to accomplish any normal purpose. Business, labor, professions, exist primarily in thought. And the outcome of your labors in them is regulated by thought. Consider the difference, then, in this outcome if you have at your command only the limited capacity of your conscious mind, compared with the boundless energy of the subconscious and of the creative force working through it. Thought, not money, is the real business capital, says Harvey S. Firestone, and if you know absolutely that what you are doing is right, then you are bound to accomplish it in due season. Thought is a dynamic energy with the power to bring its object out from the creative force all about us. Matter is unintelligent. Thought can shape and control. Every form in which matter is today is but the expression of some thought, some desire, some idea. You have a mind. You can originate thought. And thoughts are creative. Therefore you can create for yourself that which you desire. Once you realize this, you are taking a long step towards success in whatever undertaking you have in mind. You are the potter. You are continually forming images good or bad. Why not consciously form only good images? More than half the prophecies in the scriptures refer to the time when man shall possess the earth, when tears and sorrow shall be unknown, and peace and plenty shall be everywhere. That time will come. It is nearer than most people think possible. You are helping it along. Every man who is honestly trying to use the power of mind in the right way is doing his part in the great cause. For it is only through mind that peace and plenty can be gained. The earth is laden with treasures as yet undiscovered. But they are every one of them known to the God mind, for it was this mind that first imaged them there. And as part of universal mind, they can be known to you. To the manner born few of us have any idea of our mental powers. The old idea was that man must take this world as he found it. He'd been born into a certain position in life, and to try to rise above his fellows was not only the height of bad taste, but sacrilegious as well. 
And all wise providence had decreed by birth the position a child should occupy in the web of organized society. For him to be discontented with his lot, for him to attempt to raise himself to a higher level, was tantamount to tempting providence. The gates of hell yawned wide for such scatterbrains, who were lucky if in this life they incurred nothing worse than the rippled scorn of their associates. That is the system that produced aristocracy and feudalism. That is the system that feudalism and aristocracy strove to perpetuate. What was it that Jesus taught which aroused the wrath of the priests and the rulers? What was it that made them demand his blood? Not the doctrine of the one God. Not the teachings of love instead of hate. But the fact that he went up and down the length and breadth of the land teaching that all men were equally the sons of God. That would never do. That would ruin their system, spread discontent, cause uprisings against their authority. It must be stopped at any cost. Yet Jesus' teaching has lived to become the basis of all democracies that man is not bound by any system, that he need not accept the world as he finds it. He can remake the world to his own ideas. It is merely the raw material. He can make what he will of it. It is this idea that is responsible for all our inventions, all our progress. Man is satisfied with nothing. He is constantly remaking his world. And now more than ever will this be true, for psychology teaches us that each one has within himself the power to use the creative force to become what he wills. Learn to control your thought. Learn to image upon your mind only the things you want to see reflected there. You will never improve yourself by dwelling upon the drawbacks of your neighbors. You will never attain perfect health and strength by thinking of weakness or disease. No man ever made a perfect score by watching his rival's target. You have to think strength, think health, think riches. To paraphrase Pascal our achievements today are but the sum of our thoughts of yesterday. For yesterday is the mold in which the creative force flowing through us took shape. And cosmic energy concentrated for any definite purpose becomes power. To those who perceive the nature and transcendency of this force, all physical power sinks into insignificance. What is imagination but a form of thought? Yet it is the instrument by which all the inventors and discoverers have opened the way to new worlds. Those who grasp this force, be their state ever so humble, their natural gifts ever so insignificant, be. Come our leading men. They are our governors and supreme lawgivers, the guides of the drifting host that follows them is by an irrevocable decree. To quote Glenn Clark in the Atlantic Monthly, Whatever we have of civilization is their work, theirs alone. If progress was made, they made it. If spiritual facts were discerned, they discerned them. If justice and order were put in place of insolence and chaos, they wrought the change. Never is progress achieved by the masses. Creation ever remains the task of the individual. Our railroads, our telephones, our automobiles, our libraries, our newspapers, our thousands of other conveniences, Comforts and necessities are due to the creative genius of but 2% of our population. And the same 2% own a great percentage of the wealth of the country. The question arises, who are they? What are they? The sons of the rich? College men? No few of them had any early advantages. Many of them have never seen the inside of a college. It was grim necessity that drove them, and somehow, some way, they found a method of drawing upon their creative force, and through that force they reach success. You don't need to stumble and grope. You can call upon the creative force at will. There are three steps necessary, first, to realize that you have the power. Second, to know what you want. Third, to center your thought upon it with singleness of purpose. To accomplish these steps takes only a fuller understanding of the power that is within you. So let us make use of this dynamo, which is you. What is going to start it working? Your faith the faith that is begotten of understanding. Faith is the impulsion of this power within. Faith is the confidence, the assurance, the enforcing truth, the knowing that the right idea of life will bring you into the reality of existence and the manifestation of the all power. All cause is in mind and mind is everywhere. All the knowledge there is, all the power there is, is all about you no matter where you may be. Your mind is part of it. You have access to it. If you fail to avail yourself of it, you have no one to blame but yourself. For as the drop of water in the ocean shares in all the properties of the rest of the ocean water, so you share in that all power, a wisdom of mind. If you have been sick and ailing, if poverty and hardship have been your lot, don't blame it on fate. Blame yourself. Yours is the earth and everything that's in it. But you've got to take it. The creative force is there but you must use it. It is. Round about you like the air you breathe. 
You don't expect others to do your breathing for you. Neither can you expect them to use the creative force for you. Universal intelligence is not only the mind of the creator of the universe, but it is also the mind of man, your intelligence, your mind. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. I am success, though hungry, cold, ill-clad, I wander for a while, I smile and say, it is but for a time, I shall be glad tomorrow, for good fortune comes my way. God is my father, he is wealth untold, his wealth is mine, health, happiness and gold. Ella Wheeler Wilcox So start today by knowing that you can do anything you wish to do, have anything you wish to have, be anything you wish to be. The rest will follow. Ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. A funny world there is a world, a funny world, that's not a world at all, a world that has no shape nor size, that's neither sphere nor ball, you think at first that it exists, you think it very true, then, finally, you see the point, that it's just fooling you. Perhaps, you once lived in this world with all its hates and fears, you were a glum and saddened soul, believed in pains and tears, you thought you had to be diseased and thought there was a hell, when, all at once, you learned the truth. This world just went pell-mell. And, then, this world, this shadow world, just disappeared from sight, and in its place a world of joy, of health, of love and light came into view right where you were, you came to understand that you abide in heaven now and God is right at hand. Frank Blenlary Whitney The goal if you think success success has begun, if you think you can win, your battle is won. Whatever you need you can have, you'll find, it's all in the way you set your mind. If you feel that your part in the world is small, you may never achieve your work at all, but feel that your life, of God's life is a part then you'll work in the way you have set your heart. If you know you are great, you will do great things, your thoughts will soar on eagle's wings, your life will reach its destined goal, if you know the way to set your soul. Catherine Wilder Ruggles